Good afternoon, good morning, who knows when you are tuning into this, but my name is Taifa Butler and I am the President and CEO of the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, joined by my esteemed colleague, Danny Canso, who is our Policy Analyst for our Budget and Tax Work, which is over overarching um, fiscal policy. And Danny's done a lot for our organization to help set the context of where we are in terms of our budget and our taxes and in this fiscal situation. Um, I can't tell you how much on behalf of GBPI and our team, um, how our hearts are going out to Georgians right now and those all over the world who are managing through this global pandemic. Um, just know that we are committed to doing the work of our organization, which is to advance policy solutions that will advance and expand economic opportunity for all Georgians, all Georgians. And we see this as such a critical time because from health, uh, education, wealth, economic, um, all those things are being challenged right now to ensure people's well-being. So our job today is to just sort of level set um, where we are fiscally in, in our state. We've talked about um, a lot of importance of focusing on saving people's lives right now, um, bolstering our public health infrastructure to make sure Georgians can get through uh, this pandemic, um, getting the tests that they need, getting the health access that they need um, to, to be able to heal from, from COVID-19. We've also talked about mitigating economic harm for families who are out of work or have to stay home and shelter in place because their children are at home, childcare centers are closed, schools are closed, and what that means for them in their pocketbooks and making sure that they can manage with unemployment insurance and other ways to, to put more money in families' pockets. And so the third conversation that really hasn't been had right now uh, in our state is what the fiscal outlook looks like. And Danny released a report this week that projected some of the challenges that our state will see um, in terms of lack of revenues. Because if you all know, um, our state budget depends heavily on income taxes. It's 51%, right, Danny, of, of our state uh, revenues. Uh, sales taxes, of course, are another like 24%. So when we don't have income taxes coming in and sales tax from us being able to spend and consume, we, we will see a likely reduction in that budget and um, a shortfall that, that we are projecting. Um, so, Danny, before we get started, I wanted to help people understand, too, like, what, what's the context of Georgia in terms of our spending? Do you want to give um, our, our watchers or viewers sort of some quick budget facts on, on where we are? Absolutely. Well, it's great to be with you, Taitha, and, and we're thankful for all of those who are tuning in. And, and we really are privileged in this moment to be able to look forward and, and offer solutions for Georgia and, and try to come out of this the best that we can, both in our immediate response and in what we do over the long term. Um, and, and so one of the things that, you know, has been really sobering for us uh, in, in our work over the past decade, and, and as we've watched Georgia come out of the Great Recession, is that in many ways, we're in a weaker position than we were uh, before that economic crisis hit. And so we know that overall, when we adjust for Georgia's population growth and, and just inflation, we spend less today already prior to the, the, the current crisis than we did in 2008. Um, prior to the financial crisis. And so our budget's about 3% less than it was um, in, in 2008. And, and that means uh, about $900 million less is, is being spent today than, than we would have um, prior to the recession. And, and of course, we know that we can't just stay the same. Uh, we know that, that proactive investments require us to reach further, but across education, across healthcare, across so many of those vital areas of, of our state's spending, um, we, we have not improved over the past decade. And that's had a lot of opportunity cost for the state. And we don't want to see a similar situation happen um, going forward. And so when we look around the nation, uh, that puts Georgia at the very bottom in terms of the growth of state spending um, since the Great Recession. And, and we cannot fall, afford to fall further behind uh, because that has real economic impact uh, for businesses and for families and for a lot of individuals across our state. And so we really haven't seen many changes in, in terms of our revenue system uh, since, since the Great Recession. And, and, and that has really uh, put a bit of a stranglehold on, on our ability to make those investments. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we rank at the very bottom per capita in, in terms of our tax structure, uh, we, we have a, you know, we've, we've prided ourselves on many of the 
uh, business tax breaks that, that we've offered, which now amount to almost $10 billion a year um, in lost revenue of the state. But the, the problem that we have is that, that while some of those may be worthy and, and may have brought some valuable industries to Georgia, we really do very little in terms of evaluating that return on investment and, and what we could get from competing priorities. Um, and, and so, you know, right now, uh, while the current crisis is, is very worrying and, and we'll get into some of those fiscal challenges, uh, we do have a, a pretty wide array of options and, and untapped resources um, that, that are really at the table. And so I think we'll talk about some of those um, things that we can lean into that, that'll help us not only get past the current fiscal crisis, but hopefully come out of this in a better position uh, than we were in before. Um, Hopefully, yes, Dan. That that's our that's our hope, and that's what we're fighting for. And I think to your point, we we've, we've prided ourselves as a state that we're low tax. We you know number one place to do business. But we've also recognized that that also means um, we have prioritized business tax breaks and business choices and decisions over investing in our people. And that's sort of why we launched our People Power Prosperity you know, campaign or agenda to see if we can put people first solutions on the table to make sure that families are thriving, our communities are healthy, we have educated youth and a strong workforce because we believe that those are components, right, of a strong economy. And we've sacrificed, if we're being honest, we've sacrificed some of those investments for, for us. Others. Um, and I think you, as you've done your analysis every year, I'm looking at the state budget and, you know, we give away nearly $9 billion in tax breaks and tax expenditures. We're giving away a lot of dollars that could support um, our investments, right, in public health, like we're seeing today. I mean, I think that's been a strong, uh, if nothing else, recognition that because of our limited investment in that core infrastructure of our hospitals and our healthcare system, we're seeing the results of why we're challenged um, in managing the response. So, so with that said, let's let's get into some of these questions. Um, as we're projecting, um, you know, unemployment claims are at an all-time high for us, and probably have reached a pitch point that we've never seen in our history. Right? Um, we've already gone into this fiscal year 2020 that ends July June 30th um, with some budget cuts. The governor, we started to slow down um, our revenues this year, and so the governor asked for some budget cuts. And Danny, am I right? It was about on average. 6% cuts that's in this current budget, in the amended budget? 4% 4, 4 in, the, in 2020, and, and of course we were contemplating 6% um, in, in the year that would start July 1st. So um, we were already in that posture, you know, to your point of, of kind of going down to the bone uh, in so many of these areas. Right, and so, so for, our, for our watchers, just so you understand, our General Assembly has been suspended. Um, we are in a state of one, we've been, our assembly is on pause, um, but when they come back before June 30th, they have to pass a fiscal year 21 budget that starts July 1st. And that current draft of that budget that's gone through the House um, has um, about 6% average budget cuts in it. Um, so our lawmakers have to come back and pass a budget before the end of June. And with the potential shortfall that we're seeing, those are going to be some very tough decisions to be made. So Danny, um, given that our budget relies heavily on income tax and sales tax, um, um, how do you see sales tax collections right now being impacted given this economic crisis? Yeah, uh, well, you know, that, that, that's a great question. And, and, you know, to your earlier point, I mean, when we talk about state spending, it's also important to say, uh, you know, 80 to 85 percent of that spending is totally enrollment driven. And so is driven by healthcare, by education, corrections, you know, those areas that we have to spend on. And so that leaves a very small piece of the pie uh, for discretionary spending, you know, about $5 billion. Um, and, and that's where those cuts were, were targeted, obviously. And so um, that, that has really been, uh, you know, what, what's, what's tied the state's hands in, in making new investments. And so um, you're, you're exactly right where the immediate effects um, are, are going to be felt through the sales tax. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get to those employment numbers and, and those are going to feed into longer term effects because uh, mm -hmm. it takes a little bit longer for that to register, uh, you know, as folks start to get those unemployment checks, which, which will expire very quickly. Um, and, and so we'll talk about that. But just in terms of the sales tax, um, you know, we really can't overstate the size of the drop that we've seen. And it's been all across industries in Georgia. Uh, you know, one of the positive things in our tax code 
is that for the most part, uh, you know, aside from prepared food, we really don't tax groceries. Um, and so, you know, in, in kind of the one area where maybe there's been a positive uptick, uh, we, we are not going to realize the benefit of those revenues. Uh, we do, however, you know, one of the things that we fought very hard for that we got in the tax code starting April 1st um, is that online retailers, uh, for the most part now, are going to be subject to sales tax. Um, and, and that's going to help us weather through uh, some of the impact, but, but it's really not going to help avoid um, some of the devastation just because of how bad the numbers are. And so the consensus is that really across Georgia's major industries, uh, we have seen and expect to see um, probably throughout uh, the, the remainder of this quarter, which will conclude the fiscal year on June 30th, about a 25 to 50 percent drop in mm. sales collections um, across Georgia's major sectors. And that, you know, that really does range pretty significantly where uh, industries like Delta uh, in our airline sector, uh, they're probably going to see more like an 80 to 90 percent drop. Um, which is going to be very significant. So when we kind of tally that all and, and consider um, even some of those positive effects, we're estimating that for the 2020 fiscal year, we're going to fall short between uh, 500 and 700 million dollars um, in, in all likelihood. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that's going to be uh, ab about a 10% drop um, in, in overall sales tax collections um, if it's towards the high end of that estimate. Uh, and, and it would reflect about a 30 to 40% drop um, over the next three months. And so when we look at sales tax collections, you know, we, we saw uh, a, one revenue report for the month of March report in, and it's also important for folks to understand that there is a delay built into that. And so the report's going to lag at least a month out uh, where most industries have about 20 days after the month ends to report their numbers to the state. Um, some industries pay by quarter, so there's even more of a lag. Um, and, and so we will expect to see those numbers starting uh, at, at the end of this month and when the first numbers come out um, in May, and, and those will reflect um, tax collections for the month of March, um, and then we'll continue to see kind of that trickle out. Um, and so some of those hits to the state um, are going to be delayed. Okay, so you so 500 to 7 million below in sales tax. Let's talk about income tax. Um, what, is, what are the effects of that we're seeing on income tax and corporate tax income taxes? Well, as you said, I mean, the surge in unemployment claims um, ha has just been heartbreaking and, and so unprecedented. Where, you know, if we look throughout the entire Great Recession, so from 2008 um, to 2012, about 340,000 jobs were lost in the state of Georgia. Already through mid-April, and, and we'll get numbers this Thursday um, that, that'll update these numbers likely even higher, we've seen more than 850,000 Georgians claim unemployment benefits. And that's not even reflecting the full extent of the problem because we're not calculating a lot of those uh, folks who are independent contractors, right. who do things like you know, Lyft and, and Uber and, and sort of you know, the gig economy. And so the, the amount and the scale of people who are out of work is really unprecedented where just those claims alone represent about 18% of our workforce. Um, and, and so, you know, as we referenced also, many of these corporations are also going to start uh, the cost cutting and the layoffs. And those are probably, you know, those are ongoing, um, but the severe effects of those are going to continue to uh, sort of stagger and, and, and probably come a little bit later. Um, but, but just in terms of that calculation, what we're estimating is that um, an unemployment rate between 10 and 20%, um, which, which again, may be a little bit optimistic at this point, right, um, right. is going to lead to uh, between $1.25 and $2.5 billion in lost revenue through the individual income tax alone. And the individual income tax is really the core of Georgia's revenue system. You know, that is where we get um, about 48% of our general budget funds. Um, mm -hmm. If you add in the corporate tax, it becomes about 51%. And so in the corporate income tax, we think the drop is going to be even more significant. Uh, you know, Georgia is, is home to about 26 Fortune 1000 companies. Um, if, if you actually look at employment in the state, although we do have about 1.1 million small businesses, and those are especially prevalent and, and dominant across rural Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, employment actually, a, a majority of it, comes from those employers with more than 500 employees. Okay. Um, and, and so, you know, those are the, the industries that, that are going to take some pretty significant hits and also have a very preferential tax treatment 
that's going to allow them to write off a lot of those losses um, and avoid paying a, a pretty significant amount of tax to the state and to the federal government. And so when, when we look at that, uh, you know, we, for 2021 right now, we're estimating about 1.5 billion in corporate tax. We think that could fall uh, by as much as $700 million, uh, if not more. And, and that's just based off of if we see kind of a similar uh, impact to what we saw during 2008. You know, the growth of the corporate income tax has been actually one of the brighter spots in Georgia in recent years. And, and part of that is because prior to this, we saw record highs in the stock market. We saw corporations get some very uh, favorable treatment in the 2018 tax bill that was passed. Uh, mm -hmm. But we expect a lot of that to be clawed back um, now that during the pandemic. And, and those effects are probably going to continue uh, even further out um, as this crisis hopefully diminishes. Right. So sales tax reductions, we stand two billion or more in corporate income combined with personal income. So, so knowing we, we have some challenges with our own state budget, um, what has been the response of some of the federal actions to date that have, will help states like Georgia? Mm -hmm. So, so far, you know, what the federal government has done has been, uh, first of all, to, to try to send out some aid to individuals and businesses. Uh, so many folks have already received or are expecting to receive um, that, that payment, which, which will be $1,200 for individuals, you know, 2400 for married couples, and, and $500 for each dependent. Um, and, and so that was part of the federal response. Um, also, the, the loan protection program for small businesses was, was a part of the federal response, um, which obviously ran out of funds very quickly. Right. Um, and, and I think about $9 billion of that was deployed in Georgia. Um, so, so that was positive, of course, and, and we're hoping that more funding will be deployed to both individuals and businesses. Uh, but on the fiscal relief side, you know, the, the truth is that uh, while, while the federal government has been helpful and, and will extend some resources to Georgia, uh, most of that, if not all of that, is going to be eaten up by the state's response to the pandemic, um, and, and very little will be available to help us close our own budget shortfall. And so what we're expecting is um, any day now, about three and a half billion dollars will, will come to the state. About six hundred million dollars will come to the four largest county governments in Metro Atlanta. Uh, basically, nothing uh, on behalf of the federal government, um, unless the state chooses to deploy some of our resources, is going to go to those smaller local governments across the state. We're obviously being hit very hard and are having to mobilize. Um, the, the full extent of their resources in response to the crisis. So uh, we, we do think that uh, when the state does formulate our response, a significant part of that is going to have to be outreach to those local governments to help support them and, and make up their costs. But in terms of the state share, uh, it'll be about three and a half billion dollars. Um, and again, much of that is, is going to be eaten up by our response. You know, we've already seen the Georgia World Congress Center uh, converted into um, right. The overflow for, for hospital beds. Um, and, you know, that, that would have been pretty unfathomable just, just a couple of months ago. Um, but, but that is kind of the scale of the response that we're having to mobilize. And that, of course, is going to be very costly. Um, and so, you know, those funds that have already been deployed are going to be spent uh, likely pretty quickly. Um, and then, you know, what we're really calling for is a strong federal response to help close this shortfall. So, you know, as, as you were doing the math, I mean, our, our budget for 2021 was supposed to be $28.1 billion. When we're adding up the, the likely shortfall across these major sources, um, it could amount to uh, up to $4 billion out of that. Um, you know, that, that's obviously uh, more than 10% of the budget um, and, and a very significant share that, that there, there, there's nowhere to pull that funding from that's not absolutely essential. Um, and so if, if we want to avoid the damage of, of what would be um, you know, a, a very severe economic downturn um, in part caused by the state cutting spending in many of these essential areas where you know, in, in counties across Georgia, you see that the largest employers are the school system, the right. hospital system, and the state. And so right. if we were to have to do something like furloughs, large-scale layoffs, both of which were seen during the last recession, uh, you know, when, when federal aid just wasn't enough to close the shortfall then, uh, that will exacerbate the economic crisis and probably increase the longevity significantly. And so yeah. we really need a robust federal effort immediately so that our state lawmakers, as you said, can pass a budget before it's supposed to go into effect on July 1st. 
And right. if they don't have the ability to do that, um, un unfortunately, we're probably likely to see some really uh, devastating cuts. Yeah, and I've heard this across our net national network of other organizations looking at their different state projections, and most states are anticipating uh, significant budget shortfalls. And not all states, like Georgia, we have $2.7 billion in our rainy day fund, or our, our revenue shortfall reserve, <laughs> the official word, right? Um, but we do have at least two, two, nearly $3 billion in that fund to help us mitigate you know, any kind of shortfall, but a lot of other states don't. And so there's been national advocacy from state level organizations, even the NGA, the National Governors Association, to ask for additional funding from the feds. And as we're seeing this fourth package be con considered, um, you know, right now the state fiscal response is not in there, you know, from what we're seeing. And, and that's concerning for many local governments like Atlanta, who wasn't even eligible for, um, you know, the local relief fund from the CARES Act. So I think uh, there's still more advocacy to be done if people want to know what can they do. Um, lots of folks are asking for people to reach out to their local, uh, their congressional delegation to, to make the case that local governments and state governments still need more fiscal help so that we can avoid the deep budget cuts that could be a response from this. And I think, Danny, you know, as we talked about this as a team yesterday and, and everybody's concerned about getting the economy back open and, you know, restarting uh, jobs because so, people want to get back to work and manage this, you know, we heard from the governor yesterday that he's reopening the government um, and, you know, gyms and salons will reopen this Friday and, you know, rest restaurants and movie theaters and things will open up next Monday. Does this, because again, if people are driven by this fiscal challenge we're in and getting the economy back started because of these deep projections, deep cut, deep um, reset, recessionary projections, does this improve Georgia's economic outlook um, in the long run? And, and could this lead to further uh, disruption in COVID uh, increasing? Uh, that's what a lot of the, the, the people's concerns are. Heck, it's my concern, right? That if we restart the economy too soon and if we don't continue to shelter in place to get back to work, you know, we could see another spike in this. So, so talk to us a little bit about whether or not this could really improve our outlook. Right. Well, that, that, that's a really important question. And so I want to take that in a couple of stages. But first, I just want to say uh, that, that no politician, whether it's the governor or the president, has the power to reopen the economy or reverse the economic damage that we're seeing. It's just not possible. We are in a global pandemic. So uh, Georgia is very dependent on trade, very dependent on international commerce. What we've seen from the projections is that globally, economies are expected to shrink by 35% this quarter. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's in terms of our trade, demand, uh, consumer spending driven by those incredibly high uh, numbers of Georgians who find themselves out of work. There's just, you know, it, it is not in the power of, of any, uh, you know, government authority or politician to reverse that and, and to say, okay, we're going to flip a switch, the economy's open, we're going to go back to where we were before all this started. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that just is not reality. Um, and, and so it's very important for folks to understand that regardless of kind of, you know, whether that former formal shelter in place order is, is operational or not, whether, uh, you know, th those places of commerce are, are able to formally open their doors under the law or not, uh, that, that still is not going to reverse the economic damage that we're seeing. Uh, and in fact, to your point, uh, if we're not careful, and if we're not very uh, carefully monitoring our surge capacity in, in our hospitals across the state, uh, many of which, you know, especially in rural Georgia, uh, are, are very stressed. Uh, you know, we, we know that the Albany area um, has been nationally and globally uh, one of the centers for uh, the highest death rates and hospitalizations. And so what we don't want to do is overwhelm those hospital systems. That's right. Uh, give folks no option to seek care. Um, and, and if we do that, obviously, that is the purpose of the shelter in place order uh, was to try to bend that curve as much as we could so that those hospitals wouldn't be overwhelmed and, th and so that folks wouldn't have options uh, if they do unfortunately come down with the virus um, and, and, and have to seek emergency care. Um, and, and so that is really uh, the purpose of those orders. It's not to shut down the economy or to restrict economic activity. It's to make sure that our hospital systems aren't overwhelmed. And so, uh, you know, and, and we heard the public health commissioner say yesterday that they're going to be monitoring that. 
and, and if there is that surge, uh, we're going to have to go back on the order and, and we're kind of going to have to start over again uh, in terms of shelter in place and, and what we're doing to keep people safe. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it really is important to understand that, you know, like with our fiscal emergency in terms of seeing a shortfall, uh, we are not in this alone. You know, That's the entire right. nation and the entire globe are experiencing these effects. Uh, when it comes to the presence of those Fortune 500 companies, uh, many of which are, are located in Georgia, they're going to make their decisions based off of their national numbers, based off where their revenues are and, and, and their borrowing capacity in terms of having, having to initiate layoffs and cost-cutting measures. And so, you know, whether or not some authority says you can open your doors um, it, it is really going to have a minimal impact. Um, on those decisions that they're going to have to make. And, you know, to your point, uh, if, if folks aren't alive, um, of course, they can't do commerce and spend money right. um, and earn it and, and be part of the economy. And so uh, that's why our, our public health concerns, obviously, do need to come first. Uh, and I, I think we're all hopeful um, that those will be what drive decision making um, so that we can try to find a, a way out of this crisis. Absolutely. Thank you for that point. And again, as we think about end of the day, people's lives being saved, protected as much as possible, and knowing that we have a tremendous amount of frontline workers that are working every day that still don't have sort of the equipment and the PPEs, um, and we're not testing at the level that we need to. So again, our infrastructure is weak right now. Um, and so knowing that we've talked about additional funds needed from the feds, uh, the federal government has you know, given dollars for hospitals, for testing, um, for some relief for the states. Um, but will that support be enough, even if we can get an additional uh, pot of, of dollars for state fiscal relief and another package from the federal government? Um, what might we do as a state, right, to help address these issues? What options do we have if we don't have any of those other federal um, funds to support us? What can we do as a state to respond? Absolutely. Well, well, we, we need that federal assistance. I mean, without substantial federal assistance, we will be in an economic crisis, you know, likely uh, the, the, it, to an extent that, that we haven't seen before. And, and nobody wants that. Nobody wants that long-term devastation. Nobody wants to see educators furloughed uh, and, and to have to experience even more stress than they already are uh, with at-home instruction. And so, uh, you know, I think we're all hopeful that that federal aid and, and its role will be to supplement those immediate shortfalls and to help us uh, keep, keep our whole government operating uh, and, and not have to accelerate the economic crisis. And so, you know, to be clear, that, that's how that's going to be used. And, you know, uh, other folks have talked about the rainy day fund. Well, you know, that rainy day fund was harder. I mean, that took uh, several hundred billion dollars every year instead of being spent uh, on new investments in healthcare and education. Uh, it's why most state agencies were asked to either cut spending or keep it flat for about a decade. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a cost to pulling money out of that too. Um, that is more like a short-term bridge loan uh, where we can pull out of the reserve, but we're gonna have to build it back up. Um, and so, you know, wherever we look, uh, you know, those are not long-term options. And so what we also understand is that even if we do get that federal aid, even if it's, if it's sufficient to close these immediate shortfalls, it's going to expire. And, you know, I, I haven't seen any uh, economist worth their salt who said uh, that, you know, or any public health expert for that matter, who believes that this is going to be a crisis that lasts weeks or months, and that we're going to be able to flip a switch uh, right. and, and go back to normal immediately after that. And so we have to understand that there are going to be long run consequences of this and that the recovery is going to have to come in stages. Uh, and so hopefully we'll get that federal aid, but it'll expire one day. Um, and so we're going to have to be ready as a state to meet that challenge and to come up with enough revenue uh, to, to not simply delay the shortfall, but to be able to avoid it entirely while also looking forward and trying to make some investments that are going to help us come out of this stronger. Uh, because I think as we'll talk about in a minute, a lot of very deep inequities have been exposed by this crisis. Uh, That's and right. we really can't allow those to stand going forward. Uh, and, and if we want to go forward in a stronger position, we're going to need to address those and close those. And so, you know, I mean, to what we were talking about earlier, uh, wh where the fat in, in Georgia's budget probably exists is in our revenue expenditures. It's in <laughs> some of these tax breaks that we offer uh, where right. there's very little accountability and honestly very little return on investment for the taxpayer. Um, mm -hmm. And so that should be where we look first. And, and we already know 
that in Georgia's tax code, we offer some very unusual arrangements that, that don't exist elsewhere. For example, uh, in, in some tax breaks, we allow them to be sold in the open market. Uh, that's called transferability. And that really does create some very perverse incentives uh, in, in terms of how you're going to generate tax breaks and how you're going to use them. Much uh, like the film tax credit, right? Well, that, that's right. And, and that's why uh, the, when you mix transferability with what's called deferred use, where you have, even if, even if it's sold to somebody outside of the original uh, authorized party who received it, it can be deferred and it's used for up to five years. What happens when you mix those things together is that you get a mountain of tax credits that build up that could hit the state and basically cause a fiscal crisis in themselves. Mm -hmm. And so our best estimate right now is that in the film tax credit, which, you know, we, we support the film industry as much as anything. I mean, we obviously think that some very positive things have come from the film industry being in Georgia. We want them to continue. You know, we, we don't want to hurt that economic sector. But at the same time, we also don't want uh, taxpayers to, to unfairly subsidize one sector over another, and especially not if it leads to uh, billions of dollars in unused credits building up that could potentially cause a, a, a fiscal catastrophe. And so, you know, our first step needs to look at that deferred use, to look at transferability, and to consider uh, how much do we want to spend on these tax credits? What is our return on investment? And, and we should make data-driven decisions in terms of what we're offering. So, so that's step one. Step two is to say, look, we offer $9.8 billion every year, uh, according to our best estimate, in, in tax expenditures and, and loopholes. And so uh, all of those are not offering a commensurate return on investment to the taxpayer. And so just you know, simple fiscal responsibility and stewardship should tell us that we need to go back and we need to conduct some kind of regular audit to determine what that return on investment is doing and, and to make some data-driven decisions in terms of where state and taxpayer dollars are going to be best used. Because for every dollar of tax expenditure that, that we're letting escape the state, that's a dollar more that a family is going to have to pay or that's that a right. small business owner. Uh, and, and that's just not fair. Um, and, and so we need to be smart um, and data-driven about our tax code. Um, and, and through that, uh, you know, we believe that we could save hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars every year uh, and, and use that in other areas um, with, you know, working family tax credit, uh, with spending in healthcare or education, and with areas that regular Georgians would see a much greater return on investment. Mm, absolutely. That's been one of the points, as long as I've been at GBPI and even before, is trying to get some kind of return on investment analysis of are these tax breaks doing what they intend to do? If they're supposed to create jobs, are they creating the jobs? You know, and if not, what clawbacks can we imp impose to make those corporations, you know, give that money back? Because at the end of the day, we are foregoing those dollars for some economic development goal um, in, in thinking that that's a better idea than investing in say our K-12 system or in our public health infrastructure or helping to pay for health coverage for people who don't have it. Um, right, I mean, you know, surely if, if there's anything that almost all Georgians can agree on, it's that we should at least have the facts. We should at least have the data and we should at least ask that question on a somewhat regular basis and, and right now we're not. And, and that's something that a lot of folks aren't aware of. Uh, but really when, when we talk about times of economic crisis and hardship, uh, where many of these very difficult choices are gonna be before the state, uh, it, it seems that that's really the least that we could do. That's right. I mean, it's to me, to your point, that's low hanging fruit. That's, you know, dollars that we have, let's review them, let's evaluate them and see if they're they being used the best. And if not, let's get those dollars back. Um, there's also been conversations for years now about Georgia being one of amongst the lowest states in our um, tobacco tax, um, excise tax. So what about that as a potential option? That's exactly right. So, you know, the, the tobacco tax right now is 37 cents per pack of cigarettes. We don't tax vaping products at all. And so we know that the costs of tobacco use are great all across Georgia. And as uh, the coronavirus has, has exposed that underlying health conditions are a major driver, uh, smoking's a major driver of that, hypertension, uh, many of the issues that are exacerbated by tobacco use are. And right, you know, prior to this crisis, in Medicaid alone, the state of Georgia is estimated to spend more than $650 million a year uh, treating tobacco-related illnesses. 
we only bring in about $230 million a year from all tobacco excises, excise taxes. And so it, it's time to write that. You know, it, it's time to at least uh, assess a tobacco tax that's capable of paying for the costs of tobacco to the state uh, and, and to Georgians as a whole. Um, and, and so what we've proposed and, and what we advocate for is, is, is a, a pretty middle of the road solution, which is saying, okay, let's at least go to the national average. The national average is $1.81. So we have been outpaced by almost every state in the nation um, and in, in this you know, very uh, you know, detrimental area that, that both causes negative public health consequences and uh, you know, weakens our ability to fund priorities in healthcare. And so if we went to the national average, we could raise an additional $575 million a year, according to our estimates. And, and that, I mean, that is kind of the lowest of low hanging fruit. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, I, I think that most Georgians do agree. And, and according to our recent poll, uh, it's about 80% of Georgians that think that going to the national average would be a good decision. Um, and, and certainly that would help us get increased funding to be able to weather the current crisis and hopefully to make some good investments um, in our healthcare infrastructure. Absolutely. I know when we did our, our poll, what, a year or so ago, and we looked at sort of public opinion around, you know, ways that we can raise revenues to invest in Georgians' health care and all those things. This one had some favorable, favorable uh, response from the public, but also uh, evaluating corporate tax breaks had huge um, public public polling in support of, of that. Um, and then I also think if, if, if our, my memory so serves me right, Danny, 90% of corporations don't have any tax um, liability or don't file anything. So again, looking at are there other ways that we are missing opportunities to engage with our corporate partners <laughs> um, and, and businesses in our state. I think there's a host of ways that we can bolster our own state revenues. And I think in this moment of this crisis, if, it, if nothing else um, is made clear for me um, as a policy researcher um, in doing this work is that if we don't invest in our infrastructure Structure as a state um, and prepare and be ready for the next crisis, um, we won't be able to, to fare well, right? Um, our, our, our residents won't, um, our state businesses and infrastructure won't. So to me, um, we have to think about what is the best revenue base for our state. And, and my concern is to make sure that it's fair. You know, as we think about who's bearing the brunt largely from this pandemic right now, low and moderate income families, those, you know, restaurant workers, those are typically in the low wage industry. Um, they are bearing the brunt of this. And so how do we make sure what, what whatever ways that we think about revenue raisers in the future that they are not then also um, feeling more pressure um, to, to, to support that those additional revenues. So we have to make sure they're fair. That's exactly right. You know, and, and, and when we look at the truth of the matter, if, if you look at who pays the most tax as a percentage of their income across the state um, and, and localities, it, it's those who make the least. Um, and, and so, you know, when, when we have a tax structure that's dominated by loopholes and, and expenditures for, for certain industries, um, that creates a really unfair playing field for a lot of folks. And that's why such a great burden um, is, is asked of those small business owners uh, that those people who are working from home uh, and, and individuals across the state. And so, um, you know, the, the way to reduce that tax um, level on, on a lot of folks in Georgia um, is to try to ask others to pay a fair amount. Um, and, and, and that's one of the things um, that, that would both improve our ability to make those investments and also make it so we're not over-relying um, on the low-income families who, who simply can't afford to pay taxes to the level um, that, that they're being asked in many cases. That's right. So, so as we close out this conversation, and Danny, I so appreciate you and your work and this team for the work that we do every day to try to advance um, solutions to help all families in the state. I know people um, are so focused right now on just living and surviving, right? You know, making sure that they have food on their tables and their family can keep a roof over their head if they are in a home or apartment. And then there are those families who don't have those things. And so I know people are right now focused on just survival. But I think, you know, part of our work and being sort of a part of this broader policy landscape in the state of Georgia is that 
that we have to think about tomorrow and the day after while everybody else might be really focused on the short term. And so long term for Georgia to be able to respond, to be able to sustain um, who we are as a state and, and what we're trying to do, we have to think about the long term uh, implications of this moment. And, and I'm sort of um, not anxious, but certainly thinking about, you know, as you all, Alex and the team are projecting out, you know, how long this recession could, pandemic induced recession could last. Um, looking at 2022, like this is gonna be a long-term um, plan for, for us and the recognition that uh, many families, low-income families, many families of color um, who have not quite recovered from the Great Recession. You know, we're 12 years out of the Great Recession and many families' incomes have not rebounded back to 2008, 2009. They're still living with wages that are below where they were before. So how do we make sure Georgia and our families can you know, be better on the other side of this? What does a post-COVID economy look like? And that's where my head is right now, right? Making sure we have the right tax um, structure in place, we have the right revenues that we can bolster our public health for the future, our education system that is really going to need support right now more than ever. When we think about the, the impact that students are going to come back potentially, hopefully in September or August, um, having not been in school for the last five months, the mental health needs, the, the um, challenges for them to come back and just sort of assess where their learning is and get back going. Uh, there's just so much. And, and my fear, uh, and many of our fear, is that um, we'll see another K-12 situation where we're going into austerity and the funding formula will be cut like it did through the last recession. You know, we saw a billion dollars worth of cuts each year for K-12 for a while. So, so all I have to say, we have tremendous challenges, but Danny, I'm hopeful that people can see that the sun is still shining, right? And there's an opportunity for Georgia to be stronger and better. And if you have any closing thoughts too, as we wrap this conversation up about how, how we can bolster um, our tax base for the future. Absolutely. Well, you know, th those are such important questions and, and, and we are privileged at GBPI to be able to look forward. And, and we are going to be offering a lot of proactive solutions um, in, in our work moving forward. And so that's something that folks can look forward to. But, you know, I mean, one of the things that we think about and as we reflect on our experience from the Great Recession is that it's simply not possible to cut our way to prosperity. We can't cut our way to growth. We can't cut our way to economic recovery. Um, and so rather than asking, who are we going to lay off or who are we going to furlough? What we should be asking is, what investments can we make to grow stronger after this? What can we do to make up for the lost instruction time that so many students across Georgia yes. are going to feel when they do hopefully go back to school? What can we do in the very stressed regions across our, across our state that, that have basically seen their hospital infrastructure crumble in the 21st century uh, and, and that are on the cusp of closure? Uh, what can we do to, to help those Georgians get back to work and to be in a stronger economic position uh, than they're in now and then they, the, the, than they were in uh, prior to this when, when so many folks uh, were experiencing stagnant wages um, and, and, and slow recovery. And so the, the answer is that, that we can grow our way out of this. Um, we can make those positive investments and correct those inequities where they've been exposed. Yes. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the two key areas that, that, that we uh, really advocate for and, and, and you know, that, that we're going to see results from are, you know, well, we'll first in the immediate term, it's, it's the safety net. It's making sure that folks don't fall so far that they can't recover. Um, and it's having those immediate tools like unemployment insurance, like SNAP, uh, like those programs that are going to help folks not go hungry and not lose their homes um, and, and their livelihood. And so that's, that's gotta be the immediate response. Uh, but then it's looking at healthcare and education. Those are the areas that we know we're gonna get the biggest bang for our buck, yes. where, where we have some of the greatest weaknesses um, and where we can come out strong. And so one of the things that's really been exposed um, on the educational front and, and in the business front that, that folks haven't thought about enough is our lack of rural broadband. And so as a state, we don't have a dedicated investment that we make in rural broadband right now. But we do know that about 1.6 million Georgia households don't have adequate access to high-speed internet. You know, in, in 2020, 
that's absolutely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's actually one of the areas that, that we can work on through bonding, you know, where we can get a billion dollars of bonds for about a hundred million dollars of debt service a year. Um, and that's an area that the state of Georgia has been very conservative in um, since the recession. Um, and, and so rural broadband has to be one of the focus areas um, that, that our General Assembly and state leaders look at um, after this crisis to, to see how we can correct some of those major weaknesses and how we can help our rural communities recover. Um, without that, it's going to be extremely difficult um, to make the improvements that we need to in healthcare and education. Um, you know, we, we need to look at how we correct our state's uninsured rate, which has right. the unfortunate distinction of being one of the highest in America. And right. so, you know, what, what we've seen is folks, folks have deferred to the fact that, okay, some of the federal responses have made testing free. Well, you know, that, that's great. But for so many folks who have those underlying health conditions, that's right. who can't get the health care that they need, who can't get their prescriptions filled, who are you know, rationing insulin and, and other medications that are essential for them to live, uh, this has exposed some really devastating weaknesses in our healthcare system. And so Georgia has an opportunity to try to correct that and, and to take advantage of billions of dollars that are on the table right now so that we can try to build a stronger healthcare infrastructure um, yes. with paying customers. Um, and, and so that needs to be one of the first things that we look at. And, you know, that's not going to solve every problem in the world. It's not a silver bullet by any means. But if right. we're not insuring those folks and we're not taking care, you know, taking advantage of the minimum level of support that's available, we are missing a huge opportunity and, and we're weakening our healthcare infrastructure every day that we don't do that. And so right. that needs to be a major focus, not only in Medicaid. Um, but also in, in, in the insurance market. In the marketplace. Doing everything that the state can do to get folks access to the most affordable coverage possible that'll cover the widest range of services. Um, because Amen. We're, we're going to have a population that, that is you know, unhealthier than their uh, counterparts across the nation, a weaker healthcare infrastructure, hospitals that are on the brink of closure, uh, and especially after they take the financial hit that's going to result from, from this pandemic. And so our healthcare system, you know, cannot go ignored and, and we have to make those adjustments. In education, yes. you know, we, we've seen teacher pay raises, uh, the, the first major teacher pay raise put into effect in the current budget, a teacher pay raise proposed for next year that unfortunately, unless we do get sufficient federal aid, it is likely to not happen. Uh, right. but, but that was making up for ground that was lost over the last 10 years. And so if you look at per capita education funding, it, it really has been basically stagnant through, through the recession forward. And so right. if, if Georgia is going to grow to the level that we want to, if we're going to produce a workforce that really is skilled and up to the challenges of, of being a leader in this economy, then we're going to have to invest more in K through 12 public education and in our technical colleges and in our university system. We're going to have to find a way to get to, uh, you know, tuition subsidies that are made available uh, for low income students. Uh, who in many cases are missing out on the HOPE scholarship um, and, and who aren't able to attend higher education without taking out massive levels of student debt. That's right. We've proven that we can do that. I mean, the HOPE scholarship was a huge success in part That's right. because we took all comers, you know, be, because we paid attention to, to many of those areas in Georgia that were ignored for far too long and, and the dividends were enormous. And so if, if we invest in those essential programs that are going to keep Georgians from, you know, falling too deep and, and losing their homes and, and losing their livelihood, and then if we turn and say, how can we bolster our healthcare infrastructure and our education system, we can see returns um, over the long term, medium term and short term that are going to allow us to come out of this even stronger um, and, and that are going to make up for a lot of the shortfalls that we've seen in recent years. Um, and, and hopefully help us build a much stronger state. So I think we're all, all optimistic uh, that, that we're going to be able to put forward a lot of common sense solutions um, that'll help us do that um, while prioritizing Georgia families and, and making sure that folks uh, have as many opportunities to be successful as possible. Thank you, Danny, so much. And I can't underscore what you said <laughs> enough. Um, that we can't cut our way out of pro to prosperity. We have to invest if we want to be this state that, um, you know, boasts no place to do business. But, you know, I've always said it doesn't have to be a zero sum. 
right, where businesses win and families lose. This can be a both and <laughs> uh, situation. And right now, we haven't done enough to ensure that families and people and workers are strong and stable and sustainable and thriving. And so everything you've laid out about making sure we have a strong safety net, uh, especially in a moment like this, like this crisis, where food on the table and, you know, making sure people can, won't be evicted from their homes in this interim. There are things that our lawmakers and leaders can do to help people manage through this crisis. But at the end of the day, we need investments to be made to make Georgia that stronger state that we all want it to be, a state where all people prosper. Um, and so with that, um, I just ask you to continue to do the great work that you're doing. I so appreciate you and this team, like I said. We um, at GBPI will continue to do our work to make sure that our leaders are putting forth people first, people centered ideas um, as we come out of this pandemic. And we believe we will come out of it and we can be stronger, but we need public will and political will to come together on this um, to make sure that we're investing in the state that we want. And it's that state that has a strong um, workforce, thriving families, healthy communities, and educated youth because we need them for tomorrow. <laughs> and so again, those are the pillars of our people powered prosperity uh, agenda. Let's make this economic vision for Georgia possible. And that means we've got to invest. We've got to invest in our folks. And the most important thing we have to do is make sure that people survive and people live. And so Georgia, I hope you stay home, use common sense. Um, we need to continue to do what's necessary to protect our neighbors and our loved ones and our communities. And so that being first and foremost, and then as we slowly bring the economy back, but Danny, you called it, not one person can make a unilateral decision. There's so many layers globally around what is uh, affecting our economy. So let's be mindful of that and let's use wisdom as best we can as we move forward. But at the end of the day, I hope that we can hold on to hope <laughs> um, that Georgia and the, the strong families that we do have can manage through this crisis. Thank you, Danny, for sharing lunch with me today. And uh, I appreciate you and the team at GBPI and all of you who tuned in to, to, to listen to our conversation about the fiscal uh, challenges Georgia's facing, but also the opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you.